Okay, folks, good afternoon. Um, we'll get started. Um, so you're very welcome to this um, book talk uh, organized by the BISA uh, European Security um, Working Group by Andrew Cotty. Um, and my two uh, co-coordinators of the working group are uh, Nelly Ewers Peters and Tony uh, Newhouse. And today's um, talk will be given by uh, Professor John Denny, who will talk about his book, uh, Coalition of the Unwilling and Unable, European Realignment and the Future of American Geopolitics, which was published by uh, Michigan University Press um, last year. Just to say, I think that um, anyone who's been following um, academic and policy debates uh, on uh, NATO, uh, and in particular, perhaps NATO's uh, efforts to ongoing efforts to reform itself and the issue of NATO plans for the defense of its Central and Eastern European members will be familiar, I think, with John's work. John has published uh, a wide number of books and articles on NATO uh, and various aspects of uh, transatlantic relations. Uh, and today, in addition to um, talking us through uh, the core points of his book, uh, John's also going to reflect on some of the themes from his book uh, in the context of the uh, Ukraine conflict. So thanks very much, John, and over to you. Henry, thank you. It's really an honor uh, and a privilege to speak to you all today. Um, let me make sure I'm sharing my screen appropriately. Okay, there we go. Hopefully you're seeing my opening slide. Um, my name is John Denny, as Andrew mentioned, and I'm a research professor at the US Army War College. I'm also a, uh, a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlanta Council in Washington, DC, and I have an affiliation with American University also in DC. But since uh, Uncle Sam uh, writes my, signs my paychecks, I must begin with a disclaimer that the views I'm gonna express are mine and mine alone and don't necessarily reflect those of the US government, the US Department of Defense, or the US Army. So, uh, with that disclaimer out of the way, let me now talk about uh, how I first took on this project before I dive into the details of it. Um, this really fell out of uh, some questions I had after my last book uh, published in 2017 on NATO and Article 5. In that book, I tried to examine NATO's re-embrace of Article 5 from an ends, ways, means construct. And of course, when we talk about the means, we are talking about defense resourcing. And uh, what I wanted to do in this book was to examine a little more in depth, kind of step out of the weeds of NATO per se, and examine a bit more in depth, the degree to which some of America's leading allies have the, the wherewithal uh, to do all the things that Washington is hoping to do with them over the next decade. And so uh, the book, as Andrew mentioned, just came out in early 2021. Um, paperback should be out in a few months. Uh, and in any case, it looks out over the next decade, that is the 2020s, and tries to assess whether and how uh, these uh, leading allies of the U.S. in Europe uh, will have the wherewithal to, uh, to assist us in what we hope to do in the world, uh, not merely in the military realm. Now, uh, the book, for those of you uh, of a more academic bent, and I, I say this to uh, with great respect to this audience, uh, is not a theory testing book but it is uh, is grounded in theory. You're gonna see some of the, as I go through some of the explanation, you'll see some of the assumptions that I make, um, particularly those grounded in neorealism, but I also draw on neoliberalism as well as constructivism in some of the explanations that I'll offer. Uh, the research itself is based on a variety of primary sources, secondary sources, and about uh, a little over four dozen interviews with military and security experts on both sides of the Atlantic. So with that introduction out of the way, let me now jump into the details. Uh, why does your, first of all, why does your matter from the American perspective? Uh, this is probably obvious to many of those in the security field, but uh, I think it's important to remind um, European audiences who are experts in this field, um, why from Washington's perspective, your matters to us. From my, from my perspective, the leading rationale is really the economic and trade relationship. Uh, when we include investment and trade in goods, that relationship is second to none in the world. Uh, you can see I compare it there in some of my, uh, the, the sub bullets to the trade and investment relationship the United States has with China. 
And in, in most of these major categories, that is exports and imports, jobs, and who holds our debt, increasingly important in my country, uh, Europe matters uh, more than any other region of the world, or certainly more than, than China does at this point. Now, that's not to say this won't change, right? Uh, but as I look out over the next decade, this seems to me to be uh, fairly consistent over the next decade. Of course, Europe is also a community of values. Uh, those values are reflected in, uh, rooted in the uh, Washington Treaty that established Treaty that established NATO. And then, of course, we view Europe as a, a burden-sharing partner uh, for all the things that we hope to do or want to do in the world, including in the military realm. Now, in my title there, uh, the subtitle references American geopolitics, and um, in fact, the the, the first part of the title probably should have had a question mark after it, but uh, my editors at the University of Michigan Press prefer not to do that. So um, it's, a, it's a bit more, I think they were hoping to stir a bit more of the, uh, of the water. Uh, but the second part of the title, what do I mean by American geopolitics? Well, with specific reference to European allies, you'll see this unfolding array of uh, studies, reports, strategies that the United States has written over the last 25 years or so, really dating back to Bill Clinton's time. Through all of these, uh, through Republican administrations, Democratic ones, from administrations uh, that were decidedly pro-transatlantic, uh, like Joe Biden, you see the most recent document there on top, the interim national security strategic guidance to a president who um, frankly had, at best, we could say mixed opinions toward Europe, that is Donald Trump, uh, one consistency, uh, there was one consistent element of all of these, and that is that the United States prefers to work in the world with allies, and specifically European allies. This has been a remarkably consistent aspect of American grant, grant strategy for at least the last 25 years, arguably even longer than that, dating back to uh, the Cold War and perhaps even before that. But this is uh, fairly amazing given the disparate nature of presidential administrations and policies we've seen over the last 25 years. Now, as we dive into the details beyond that strategy or beyond those strategies, why, do, why does Washington want to have allies by our side? Well, there are an array of reasons, and you'll see some of them enumerated here. Uh, you'll also see here how uh, a lot of my work is rooted not simply in neorealism, but also in neoliberalism when we talk about legitimacy overseas and also constructivism when we talk about the historical or cultural relationship between the, uh, the two sides of the Atlantic Ocean. I should note that um, one of the assumptions I make in the book is that uh, state power is based upon uh, two, more than this clearly, but uh, based primarily upon two factors. Uh, one, the strength of a state's economy, and two, uh, the size and trajectory of its population over time. So with that assumption out of the way, let me dive into the problem now, or defining the problem that I try to take on in the book. I argue that as we think about, as America thinks about working with its European allies over the next decade, that there is and have been strategic level change underway across most of the major allies, all of them, uh, in fact. Uh, this is uh, most obvious in the case of uh, the United Kingdom, for example, and Brexit. Uh, the vote and then the, the impact of that economically as well as militarily uh, will have some serious implications for, for the United Kingdom in terms of its willpower, its capacity, its capability to do things around the world. But there are other examples of this as well. And so uh, I look specifically at five countries. Uh, the first four are probably the, the most obvious, what we might think of in Washington, at least, and perhaps in Europe, as well as the big four, the UK, France, Germany, and Italy. Uh, I include Poland there in this as well. And the reason why I focus on these five countries is that if we look back at the last 30 years or so, that is since the end of the Cold War, it's been these five countries that have most frequently been by America's side when it comes to uh, our efforts internationally, uh, whether those are diplomatic, political, military, or economic, in the case of sanctions, for example. Uh, these five countries have consistently been uh, partners with the United States in a variety of 
uh, international endeavors, uh, especially and including military ones. And so I, I limit my study to those five. There's an argument to be made that I could have roped in Turkey or Spain or uh, perhaps Romania or Norway. But in terms of uh, the importance of these five countries from America's perspective, um, I should say in terms of the importance of European countries from the American perspective, these five stand out among most. So what I'm gonna do now is walk through what are the strategic level changes that I've seen uh, occurring in these countries or that continue to unfold and what are their implications. Now I'm gonna give you the Cliff Notes version of this, right? Uh, the book uh, here is, I don't know, 200 or so, 250 pages or so in length. And I'm gonna try to summarize it for you uh, within less than, than 15 minutes. So I'm necessarily gonna gloss over some things if, um, if you'd like, we can dive into the details in the, in the q and I'm going to aim to wrap up by um, half past the hour, though. So first, let's begin with um, the UK. And I'll spend a bit more time here, given my audience, uh, sort of unpacking what I see unfolding here. And of course, I've got that rather provocative subtitle, Demise of the Special Relationship. Um, the special relationship, as it's said, is often spoken um, uh, in more of a British accent than an American one over the last couple of decades, but this still matters to Washington. Uh, we have traditionally, and I think to some degree still, the view the United Kingdom as our right-hand partner um, in all manner of international engagement, but especially in military terms. Um, and so what do we see unfolding there? I don't think I need to tell this audience that, um, sorry, I've got a chart there that I want, there we go. Um, Expectations were, of course, prior to the Brexit vote, that the vote that leaving the EU would make the UK worse off economically. There were a variety of predictions, uh, some ranging from you know, dr dramatic, dramatically worse off in the case of no agreement or a so-called hard landing um, to perhaps less worse off if uh, an agreement was a reach that uh, would be closer to what perhaps Norway has uh, with the EU. Um, but we can see there that this was widely known um, in the UK uh, by the populace there. Polling data indicates that. And yet, uh, frankly, that, that didn't matter so much when it came down to the real vote. Um, so what have we seen so far? Uh, in summary, we've seen a higher cost of living uh, for the UK, uh, for British citizens. GDP is already down uh, since the referendum. Trade is down with the EU and even globally. And uh, a couple thousand jobs have left London. Uh, not as bad as was predicted, but uh, still some significant impact. Let's unpack that a bit further. I've got a couple of charts here to show you. The one on the upper left shows uh, GDP growth of the US, the UK, and the Eurozone. And you can see there that following the referendum, uh, we began to see this slight divergence. Uh, it doesn't look that dramatic, but as uh, political economists or economists will tell you, uh, even a slight, you know, 1% uh, drop in GDP compared to what was expected can result, can um, equate to thousands of jobs lost. The upper right chart shows business investment, which had been growing by 5% year on year before the referendum has obviously flattened. Uh, and we see there the impact of COVID. And then the bottom chart shows the exchange rate. I've been telling my American friends, there's never been a better time for Americans to go to the UK, given that exchange rate. So uh, since the, the, agreement between the UK and the EU has come into force, we know that uh, trade volumes uh, have declined. There's been a 4% reduction in the size of the UK economy expected over the long run, uh, which is in line with uh, some of the pre-Brexit forecasts. Uh, and we know that at least as of October of 2021, exports and imports were down 15.7% below the level that would have been expected had the UK remained in the EU. Now, what's the so what of that? Um, I think it's pretty clear, I argue in the book, that the so what of that from a, a security perspective me, is that first and foremost, there's a reduction in tax revenue relative to what might have been expected. So over the longer term, we might see a relative slowing, still growth, obviously, but a relative slowing of the UK economy. We're likely to see lower productivity rates. We might see this slow but steady what I call an Italy-like decline, I'll get to that in greater detail in a moment, uh, and um, reduced immigration over time. 
Uh, in the worst case scenario, we might see Scotland secede. Uh, there are some significant security implications there, especially considering the uh, where the UK bases its nuclear submarines, its nuclear deterrent. Um, the same might occur with regard to Northern Ireland, perhaps less in terms of security implications there, but um, leaving us with um, a rump Britain. Um, even in the, in, the, uh, in the absence of Brexit, though, we know there's still the austerity hangover. And uh, military investments continue. Uh, for example, the two new carriers and the F-35s. I argue in the book, these give the appearance of serious defense investment. Uh, but we know that several years ago, I would think it was the, the maybe under the Cameron administration, um, the question was asked, what if we were to cancel uh, the carriers? Because they looked frankly unsustainable over the long run in terms of manpower and maintenance. And the answer returned was that it would cost the UK more in terms of contract cancellation fees and lost jobs uh, to cancel those versus simply continuing with them. And we know that um, all services, all branches of the UK military, including the Navy, continue to have manning challenges. Uh, the most recent deployment of the, one of the carriers uh, had to be augmented by F-35s from the US Marine Corps, as well as um, a Dutch frigate, I believe. So in sum, I argue in the book that reduced capabilities over time means a reduced capacity. And I think by the end of the decade, what we're going to see evidence of is a reduced strategic horizon. And I draw on two examples, two historical examples of this in the book. That is the reduced strategic horizon or the reduced strategic appetite, you might think of it. Uh, that is a lagging indicator following a decline in economic capacity, uh, which then is followed by a decline in military capacity and capability. And the two examples of that are first the United Kingdom about 50 years ago when it um, basically uh, decided to withdraw from east of Suez, um, and more recently, the Netherlands. Between about 2005 and about 2017, we see again this uh, reflected in Dutch strategies that were released in that time period, reflecting the, the, the downturn in Dutch capabilities and uh, military capabilities and capacity. Now, I know that in 20, uh, 2020, there was this announcement about, um, I think, another 20 billion uh, British pounds for the defense budget. But frankly, I think if we unpack that a bit more, and maybe we could do that in the Q&A, there's a lot more smoke than fire in that announcement. Uh, and we know most recently, given the rise of inflation, uh, we're hearing uh, that um, the purported investments in UK defense are um, going to be uh, degraded by uh, inflation. And in fact, we, we expect to see year on year in real terms an actual decline in the British defense budget. Uh, so there's pressure now on Boris Johnson's government to perhaps do something about that and announce an increase in, in defense spending. So let me leave the UK there for now. We can, of course, return to this in Q&A in greater detail, if you'd like, and turn next to France. I argue that in the case of France, we see uh, what I term an incomplete revolution. Uh, Emmanuel Macron came to power in 2017, promising um, a political revolution, kind of merging left and right or drawing on left and right. Uh, but that, and that was going to be predicated on an economic revolution or tied to an economic revolution. And we know that he's made, um, made an effort to rejuvenate uh, the French economy, uh, but not all of those have uh, met with success yet in terms of loosening up labor markets, for example, in terms of making it easier to start or close a business uh, in France, uh, loosening the power of unions. All of these things are still works in progress. It remains to be seen whether uh, Macron will have success here. And you can see the, the chart on the right depicts unemployment, the gray line, perhaps a bit difficult to see there, but the gray line is uh, French unemployment, and you can see with Italy, uh, uh, fairly high, uh, much higher than uh, the UK, Germany, or Poland. Uh, demographics in the case of the French remain a bright spot. That is, it's one of the few countries in Europe that are projected to have a growing population over time. But this challenge of unemployment uh, doesn't help um, in this regard. And what I mean by that is, um, the, the growing population, the risk there is that that simply saps French social services more instead of 
adding productive capacity uh, to the economy. We know that current French military operations continue to sap the French military. Uh, although the, the uh, effort in Mali is uh, winding down their mission there, Operation Serval is winding down. Uh, I was at the French embassy in Washington last week and I was told that in fact, the 5,000 troops assigned to that mission, uh, about 2,000 of those are probably gonna remain in the region. They'll continue to have a relatively high operations tempo uh, probably operating from a neighboring country like Niger, but performing much the same kind of counterterrorism, anti-terrorism mission in the region. Um, at the same time, the Operation Sentinel uh, in France continues to occupy, uh, consume about 7,000 French troops on active duty with a reserve of about 3,000. That is not ending anytime soon. Now, the French did just deploy uh, diving into the weeds here a bit, but they just did employ, finally, uh, a forward element of the NATO response force to Romania, but it should be noted that's a relatively small deployment of 500 troops. Uh, they are augmented by about 300 Belgians. So what's the answer to the French challenge? Frankly, it's increased tax receipts. At this point, French strategic appetite outpaces its capacity and its capability uh, to fulfill its own goals. And so I argue in the book that until we see that happening, the French are likely uh, to fade slowly over the coming decade in terms of their ability and will to do uh, all that they want to do in the world, much less that which Washington hopes they'll be capable of. If we look to Germany, it's one of the few bright spots. Uh, Germany, I describe it as having a hegemonic role, not really being a hegemon yet, but a hegemonic role because it has yet to really translate its economic capacity into uh, military power, unique historically in that regard. But why has it achieved this over the last decade or more and its European uh, neighbors have not? Uh, in a word, labor, or two words, labor productivity is the answer. And I outline in the book some of the, uh, what, what is underwritten that. And there are two, two causes, uh, two variables are are most uh, important here. The first is German investments in what's called Industry 4.0. Think of this as uh, additive manufacturing, uh, as the chart shows here, robotics in manufacturing, artificial intelligence. Germany, more than any other country in Europe, has embraced this. And you can see on my chart there that um, if you look at the left, it's um, the leading European country uh, in terms of roboticization of industry. In fact, even outpacing uh, my own country. And the second rationale or second variable here that helps to explain this labor productivity boom we've seen in Germany over the last decade is loosening of German labor laws really about 15 years ago. Now, anybody who has worked in Germany uh, knows that uh, relative to perhaps the UK or the US, um, German labor laws are still somewhat constrictive, but nowhere near what they were 20 years ago. Uh, and so this has had a significant impact on the German economy. Uh, making it far more uh, adept, uh, responsive to changes in the international economy, changes in globalization, uh, much more so than countries such as France or Italy. Now, we know, of course, the Germans have been reluctant to translate their economic power into military power. And so for the time being, at least, their capabilities and their capacity will remain very limited. But I argue this is going to change over time. If we look at polling data, younger Germans are increasingly, relative to their elders, increasingly comfortable with a more, uh, a more involved Germany in the world, a more engaged Germany. And if we can compare Germany today to where it was a generation ago in the 90s, we see that Germany has dramatically increased its engagement, uh, even in military terms. We compare what uh, happened with regard to Bosnia in the early 90s with what Germany did in Afghanistan, it's really been a sea change. I think that trend is going to continue in terms of German will. And we just saw an excellent example of um, Germany really exercising this capacity that it has, its economic capacity, uh, with the announcement of a 100 billion euro fund uh, for defense investment. Uh, we're really seeing we're in the midst of a sea change of a German security policy. And that is enabled by the economic power that, that Germany uh, retains and looks likely to retain over the coming decade. In terms of Italy, this is the ally that I see from the American perspective of having this, the steepest decline in terms of uh, capacity and capability over the last decade. 
It's long played what we think of as a sort of fourth fiddle in Europe, but now maybe bordering on fifth or sixth, if we consider Spain or Poland. Uh, the sovereign debt crisis followed by the, uh, the migrant crisis were really a one-two punch to the Italian economy. And we've seen the impact of that um, in terms of its military capability and capacity. You'll see in the chart depicted there, all of the red boxes, red highlights, indicate a reduction in capacity and, and arguably capability uh, from about a decade ago. You'll see in almost every category, there's been a reduction in capacity. Now you might argue, well, we've got more advanced equipment these days, and that's partially true, but in terms of the manpower, uh, the drop there has, has meant there really that Italy can do less in the world. And we're seeing that reflected in what Italy is choosing to do around the world. It has uh, gradually begun a process of uh, strategic collapse really to the Mediterranean basin and perhaps uh, just barely beyond the North African littoral, um, focused primarily on that which might generate waves, future waves of refugees. Turning to Poland, finally. Uh, Poland has really been Europe's economic tiger over the last decade or more. It managed to avoid recession um, in the, the middle or the early parts of the uh, 2010s, one of the few European countries to do that in the wake of the, uh, the sovereign debt crisis. And it's taken that economic power and now invested substantially in its military. The big winner there uh, in terms of service has been territorial defense, uh, but there are challenges on the horizon. Most experts do not expect its economic growth to continue in the 5% range every year, uh, and its demographics are going in the wrong direction. That is, it has a declining population over time. Um, moreover, from a perspective of willpower to do more beyond its neighborhood, it's got kind of a myopic focus on Russia for obvious reasons, but uh, for now, uh, from Washington's perspective, that means the polls are gonna be fairly focused on their neighborhood and perhaps unwilling and unable to do much beyond that. Now, meanwhile, as we know, over the last decade, Washington was slow to wake up to the great power competition underway. The Russians and the Chinese have engaged in a, a, a dramatic modernization effort. Um, they've also been engaged, as we know, in uh, fairly aggressive hybrid operations across the world, but especially in the transatlantic space. And of course, Russia's recent, uh, recent reinvasion of Ukraine has completely upended security in Europe. Meanwhile, other challenges like climate change and the pandemics uh, remain. And so in some, I argue in the book that democracy, the international liberal order, political stability and glaciers are all in retreat right now. From Washington's perspective, that means uh, we've not needed allies um, more than at any time since the Cold War. So what can Washington do about this? I mean, clearly a lot of what I described is not in the control of Washington, but I think there, there are a couple of different ways we can influence it. Uh, most broadly by, again, re-embracing the importance of allies. I think the Biden administration has clearly done that. But I outlined in the book uh, a series, really 13 or so specific policy options available. Now, in the interest of time, I was gonna highlight the ones that are bolded here, but I think I'm going to to not do that um, and instead turn to, uh, to my conclusion um, and open this up to discussion and Q&A. But I'm happy to, I'll leave this slide up, to, uh, but I'm happy to, uh, to dive into the details if you would like. So with that, Andrew, let me turn it back over to you. Thank you. That's great, John. Well we're at three o'clock, so we'll bring this to an end. But to begin with, I'd really like to thank John. That was a really fascinating um, talk. And sometimes I think it takes someone from outside, so someone looking from the outside to tell us things about Europe. So I think, you know, your book does a fantastic job in giving, you know, really detailed analysis of the five um, European countries and linking up their economic and political issues uh, with the security uh, and um, defense debate. So again, thanks very much, John. And I'm sure we'll be glad to have you back at another time in the future. Um, Andrew, it was so my pleasure. I'll bring that to an end. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Take care.